Good morning, fellow programmers. Thanks for joining me. I'm T-Pain. And welcome to Let's Learn C++. Feel free to use the skip ahead feature on the right hand side to jump to any specific sections or examples. Make sure to have annotations turned on so you can see all the updates I make to these videos. Today I'll be using Visual Studio Community Edition, which you can download from visualstudio.com. However, you can follow along with whichever IDE or program you like. Today's focus will be on debugging. It doesn't really build on previous lessons, so you can check this out or not. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with programming, period, this is a great place to come to, actually. This is uh, Debugging 101. The fundamentals that you learn here using Visual Studio will be able to carry over across many different languages. All right, so what is debugging? Debugging is the act of committing genocide to an entire colony of roaches, ants, or brainworms. Mass murder of the proud insect kingdom is not tolerable, however, no matter how many brain worms you have. I'll let that thought wiggle around in your brain. <laughs> okay, terrible jokes. Terrible jokes! Debugging in Visual Studio, or whichever IDE text editor you choose, is probably one of the most critical and least taught skills in the field. This may be the first of two or three part series on debugging, but we'll see how this goes. We're not gonna cover everything that Visual Studio has to offer. I'm just gonna cover what I think are the most important debugging points. Feel free to check out the comments below for seeing what other people have found useful. All right, so here we are in Visual Studio, and if you ever want to get the look or theme that I have here for Visual Studios, it's pretty simple. All you do is go under Debug Options, It'll launch a little window right here, and then you go into Environment, and then under Color Theme right here, you just click and scroll down to Dark. By default, I believe it's on Blue. So you just scroll down to Dark, and you're good. All right, so we have some simple example code right here, which you are welcome to copy out for yourself, or you can just follow along as I go through it. So it's actually three different files. It has a test.h, a test.cpp, and a main.cpp file here. And all it's doing is just including the IO stream, including cmath, uh, including the test.h file. It has a simple print underscore int function here that's outputting ham and then whatever ints we're passing in through the pointer and just ending it with a new line and incrementing that into value. Then below that we have our main function in which we create our int that we're going to be using and we're using f.max. And f.max is just to show you what happens when you dive into a function that isn't actually in one of the three files that you have or one of the many files you have. And so it'll give us four. Then we create our pointer in reference to the variable created above. Then we call our print in function that we created up above. We have a simple loop that counts one to 10 here. And then another call to the print function. And finally a call to the function we've defined in another file. Cool. So there's not much going on in terms of purpose. This is all just demo code, garbage code that doesn't really do anything. But I want to hammer in the fundamentals of debug. And so the first point I want to cover is breakpoints. To set a breakpoint is quite simple. You click on the left hand gray bar uh, next to your code. It's this weird gray bar. If you click over here next to the numbers, nothing will actually happen. It's only when you click on the gray bar that you'll actually be able to create breakpoints. If I run the code using local Windows debugger, it'll launch us into debug mode. And immediately I am prompted with a couple of different options. If we expand out the UI here, I'm going to show you what these menu items do up here. So we have step into, step over, and step out of. I may have gone over this in a previous tutorial, but I really want to hammer this in. So step into is generally for stepping into functions. Um, this could lead to function declarations that we have up above, or it could lead to other files altogether. And this doesn't always have to be our own functions. In fact, it, it could actually be functions we're calling from some other file. So here we have f.max. If we step into this function, it's gonna lead us to xtgmath.h file. And it's gonna show us this declaration that we have for fmax. We don't really care about that, so we're gonna go ahead and step out of this file. And it takes us back out of this file, back to the line of code that we were at and A is about to be assigned the value. So if we go ahead and click step over, then it steps over that. And now if we mouse over the variable that we had created up above, it now has the proper value of A set to four, which is the max of four and negative five, cool. If we mouse over P, however, the current line that the arrow is pointing to, 
uh, we'll notice that the pointer p is equal to like some random place in memory. It's not the correct place just yet. That's because this line hasn't evaluated just yet. If we step over, however, or better yet, if we try to step into, it's not gonna actually do anything. It's just gonna pass right over because there's no function being called. So there's no stepping into a function. However, if we call step into function here, it will indeed step into the function. And here we have our code. We can step over, step over, and we're here now. And again, we can mouse over any variable to see what the address is for a pointer and the value is it is pointing to. And again, we're halfway through this function. If we want to, we can just simply step out of and get out of this function to have it all evaluate. And now we have this output of ham and four being output. Cool, we can step over that. Now I wanna show you another trick. Say you get into a loop and you're stepping over, you're stepping over, you're stepping over. However, it is not a function. So if you step out, what will happen is we're gonna be pulling out of the main function and instead be pulled to the file, which is exe underscore common dot nil to where the main function is actually called. So that is not what we wanna do. Instead, we're gonna go ahead and stop the program and restart it at the for loop, okay? So say we're at a for loop and we're stepping over it and we're just like, okay, I seriously just wanna be done with this. I don't wanna click a million times to get through my for loop. What can I do? You can actually set a breakpoint further down, remove your previous breakpoint, and then click continue where the run local debugger button was before. So now I just click continue and it'll continue until it hits the next breakpoint, which is right here. And now all of our for loops have been successfully evaluated and we've printed out one through nine. Perfect. So by placing multiple breakpoints, you can actually have your program step to specific points that you wanna go to. So for instance, we get to go to main or, and then we're gonna jump to this line, line 13, and then click forward again, line 16, and remove that point if we uh, get stuck in that loop, and then just click continue and we're good. If you ever want to disable a breakpoint, you can always hover over your mouse over the red button, and you'll get these two things. You'll get uh, being able to adjust the settings of it, or you can toggle and disable the breakpoint altogether and it becomes white. Very useful if you want to keep track of your old breakpoints. Okay, and we'll go ahead and stop the program here. And now we're going to go ahead and step into this test function. And again, if we just step into the function, it'll take us to the file where that function is defined, not where it's declared. It is not taking us to the H file. Oh, and something useful to take note of is that when you are actually evaluating your program, you can see this little window pops up right here called locals on the bottom left hand side. And that is all of your local variables that you are declaring and defining. So right here we have a variable of X in our CPP file, and that is the variable we create here. So if we step through our program, we'll see that it actually gets set here to zero, and then it's getting evaluating the if statements here, and then we're changing the value to two. And notice how it changed uh, slightly red or pink, and that's because the value has changed in the previous line. So any variables you have created in your program should appear in the locals window right here. Cool. All right, so let's go back to the main CPP file. And now we're out of the function. And now we're gonna go ahead and stop our program. And now we wanna show you three right-click buttons that are super useful. So we're gonna be doing this on test right here. And I right-click on test, and then we'll notice a lot of different options we'll have here. The ones that I wanna show you are actually peak definition, which is super cool. You click on peak definition and it expands out a simple little window with the actual implementation in the other file. So if you wanted to, you could actually edit it here and it will edit it in the CPP file itself. And then you can save it to make those changes. We can also close that out. Something else we can do instead of peak definition, we can actually go to definition and that'll actually take us to the file and take us to the exact line where it is being defined. Another awesome option is we can right click and click on go to declaration. And this will take us to where the prototype is declared. And that is here in the header file. Cool, very useful. So again, if you want to jump to the definition, just right click, go to definition or declaration, whatever you want. Something else that's super useful is if you right click on here, you can also on your own custom functions, right click and select find all references and find all references lists out every instance where print int is being called, implemented, or declared. And so we can rapidly just click on any one of these and it'll take us right to the line of code where it is being found. All right, now I wanna take some time to show you some other options that are found at the top of the menu bar. These are right here. First one is the find files. And this launches a small window called find and replace. Find and replace is super cool. So if I wanted to, just for the find files, I can look for 
test and then I can be as specific as I want. I can say, hey, just look in the current document find next and then it'll take me to the next instance where test is typed in. I can also look in all open documents or entire solution, any one of these. So if I wanted to, I could find the next one, keep jumping to the next one, or I can click find all, which will launch to the same function as we saw before of find all instances. And it allow us to jump quickly between all instances where we've called test. Super cool. On top of that, you can also do a replace in files. So for instance, maybe I think test is a terrible name, which it is. Instead, I want to call this function change int, and then I can click replace or replace all. And again, specifying if I want it just on the current document, the entire solution or whatnot. Uh, we can also be more specific to match the cases or match the whole word, or even use regular expressions if we so desire. But we're not gonna do any of that. We're just gonna go ahead and replace all, and that's it. Unfortunately, doing that resulted in my code completely breaking, but <laughs> it is an option, so be careful with it. Generally, replace all is a bad option. I would caution against it uh, because you don't know what you don't know, basically. Do it on a line by line basis and just take take your time because there's going to be instances where maybe you're saying, I want to replace all instances of I to another variable name, but it's also being used within other words and it would break those words. So again, be careful with replace all. Be super, super careful. Next button I want to show you is this these two buttons right here. These guys are awesome. So I'm just gonna go ahead and select uh, these these few lines of code right here. And then I'm going to click this tiny button right here that says comment out the selected lines. So I click that once, it commented out using C++'s comment method of forward slash star and ending it with star forward slash to surround the lines of code that we had selected. Very cool. And if we want to undo that or uncomment these selected lines. All we got to do is select that section again and then click the uncomment button. It uncomments that. We could click comment multiple times and it'll just comment all of those lines out or we can undo that all by uncommenting. Super useful. If you're ever trying to trim down your code, don't just delete it. Instead, when you're debugging your code or writing new code, maybe to optimize or something, just comment it out. It doesn't do any harm. You can merely just click collapse right here on the left-hand side and it pretty much hides it. And then there's this nifty feature of letting you know that there is some collapsed code here if you ever wanna bring it back. If you delete it, there's not much you can do to undo it other than going to a previous version of your programming files, which is a bigger pain in the butt. Instead, just comment it, so much easier. And then you can uncomment it like that. Next, I want to introduce you to the bookmark section, and this is super cool. So on this line of code, I'm gonna go ahead and click this button right here that's to create a bookmark at the current line of code we have. Now, let's say I close this file out, and I'm working in my file, and then I'm like, oh, wait, I wanted to go back to that file. I could go manually and go like, okay, let's open the solution explorer. And then what file was it? I think it was the header file. Yeah, okay, now we're back here. Let's say this code is hundreds of lines long. It would take you a while to actually find that one specific line of code. Instead, bookmarks saves you all of that time. All right, watch this. Click one of these two arrow buttons to navigate to the previous or next bookmark. In this case, we only have one. So we click once and then boop, it opens up our file, it takes us right to that line, and now we can begin coding whatever we want. Oh, it's so useful. Let's say we're working on another file and we're like, okay, there's some problem going on with this line of code here too. So I want a bookmark there too. And then I want uh, also another bookmark right here because I'm loving the bookmarks. So now you have three different bookmarks and you can navigate through going previous or next bookmarks that you've created. One, two, three, one, two, three. To remove a bookmark, all you have to do is click the same button you clicked to create the bookmark in the first place. So you just select the line and then you click the bookmark button again and it'll remove the bookmark. Or alternatively, you can delete all the bookmarks you have throughout your entire solution by clicking the bookmark with the X over it. And that'll clear all bookmarks once you click the yes button from its prompt. Cool. Bookmarks also stay there when you close and open your program. So if I set one bookmark here and then I close it, I'm like, I'm done for the night. Let's go ahead and leave this. And then I fire up Visual Studio again. Then when I want to, I can actually jump back to those bookmarks at any point because they will still be there saved in the solution. Super cool, man. That's super cool. All right, next I want to go through a few different problems that you could have in your code 
and some of their solutions. For math, you could be dividing by zero. Uh, just don't do that. Don't divide by zero. It'll result in your program crashing. Don't try to do modulo zero. That is to see the remainder of a number divided by zero. That'll result in an error. And don't try to do math with a variable that hasn't been initialized. Otherwise, it'll give you some garbage value or your program just won't compile. In terms of logic errors, let's say that you find if statements are not being evaluated correctly, that means that you maybe have a greater than or less than symbol reverse, or you're missing one equal sign and you are actually setting a variable equal to some value rather than checking if it's equal to. For arrays, you could be extending past the length of the array. You could be uh, reaching an index that doesn't exist, or you could have a character array that's just missing the null character at the end, or having it somewhere in the middle and, and having your character array cut too short. Uh, in terms of loops, it's possible to have a loop only execute once and you're like, why? This could be because one, you're, you're accidentally setting the variable that you're using for the loop and you're setting it some other value within the loop and it's causing it to break prematurely. Or you could have a break within it that's being triggered. You could find yourself skipping numbers and this could be because you are trying to manipulate the for loops you could be trying to manipulate the loops uh, conditional variable and change the value within it and it's not competing correctly or the logic doesn't sound. Or you could have a loop run forever because you forget to set a while loops condition to be false at some point or setting a breakpoint or something like that. With pointers, there's tons of stuff that could go wrong. You could have a pointer pointing to null memory or uninitialized memory or have some random garbage value in memory. You could be forgetting to use the dereference operators, star or uh, the brackets zero to dereference the value you're trying to get at. And you could be using a period instead of a instead of an arrow, which we will cover later when we cover classes and pointers. Again, this, this all makes sense in time. For functions, you could be missing the scope of the function or the namespace isn't correct. For the declarations and definitions, they may not have the same name or same return type or same parameters. That's simple enough. You could be forgetting to return a value from the function and that could result in an error. You could have the declaration or definition missing or incorrectly placed in your program. Finally, one of the weirdest ones is you can have the enum structure class, which we'll be covering in the next tutorial, uh, missing its semicolon at the end of a file. And that would result in the error showing up elsewhere in your program. Finally, I want to leave you some questions to ask yourself whenever you're running into problems. And these are the questions I ask myself every time I run into a logic flaw or a bug in the program. Write these down, tattoo them on your arm, whatever. What is the furthest along the program works correctly? What variables are acting incorrectly and where did they stop working right? Could I have reduced code anywhere to make things simpler on myself? Finally, and this is perhaps the most important one, have I been practicing debugging with T-Pain's debug exercises? <laughs> These are important questions, guys. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for watching. Great job keeping up. There's not gonna be any debug challenges or anything like that because we've been including them in every lesson so far. Please leave me a comment below if this helped you at all. And also check out the comments if you're having any problems or if you have some knowledge to share. Please share this tutorial series with someone special and support me on Patreon. I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your support. As always, like, subscribe, keep the dream alive.